So, hello and welcome to another episode of the Odd Couple Podcast. This is Siddharth here. And I am Dr. Sheesh. So, today with us we have a really amazing person, Mr. Thomas Hurst, an award-winning photojournalist from Seattle, Washington. He has extensively traveled and covered wars, genocides and natural catastrophes during his extensive career. His work has been honored several times by the World Press Photo, the Associate Press, as well as the Society of Professional Journalists. He was the finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for his contribution to the Seattle Times staff's coverage of the WTO riots in 1999. His work has appeared in publications such as Time Magazine, The New York Times, and The Boston Globe. But what has intrigued us is how he got into the world of photography, or should we say war photography. In 1992, the young, inexperienced, and slightly naive guest of ours, who was all of 21 years old, faked his press credentials fooled the UN and found himself in Sarajevo in the middle of the Bosnian war. This is just a crazy story. I mean, from the time we read this and to having you here now on the show, it was really crazy just reading it and I'm trying to understand the mind of a 21-year-old and I still don't get it. So I'd really like you to start your story off with a little bit of your background, maybe your family, your, your upbringing, and what made a 21-year-old decide that what he wanted to do was get into a war scene and and figure that thing out. Yeah, uh- um you know i'm 50 years old now and and i'm still unpacking the the motives you know i i i came from a very chaotic background i grew up with uh parents who were divorced um my mother as i would come to find out later in life uh was a, a drug addict and died of an overdose when i was 7 years old when i was a little boy i found her in the bathtub and where she died you know that just began at least a conscious understanding of a very chaotic world for me, a very chaotic family life for me. It obviously had already been chaotic, but I, you know, just hadn't realized it as a, as a young boy. I, you know, and I grew up in it and I, people appreciated me in terms of, you know, I, I never caused a whole lot of problems and wasn't a mean kid, but no one ever expected much from me. No one ever thought that I would be much of anything, that I would make much of my life and i grew up feeling rather invisible and i grew up not feeling valued and so when this you know became sort of a an irritant under my skin about the age of 16 or 17 thinking that you know everybody expects so little of me i wanted to just make something of my life and i didn't know what that was i i didn't uh to be honest the the first idea that i had as a career was i was going to uh go to africa and hunt poachers That was my very first uh, career idea. I was going to hunt the poachers. Uh, And that idea came to me in about, oh, I don't know, 18 or 19. So 1989, 1990, I'm graduating high school. And I actually looked into it. It wasn't that I, you know, just had the idea. I started looking into that and, and it came to find out that as as much as people appreciated my desire to save endangered species, uh, the idea of a, a white man going to Africa and hunting African men trying to kill animals was not was not a thing, was not something they desired. So I checked that off the list. I wasn't going to be a poacher hunter. So, you know, so, and, and I think there's the, just, then there's the, the, you know, the instinctual desire to test yourself, the, the rite of passage that young men have. I think you, 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 you know, there's, there's a part of that that is very much um, a piece of this story. Uh, There's the desire to test yourself, you know, there, you know, at least not in America anymore. Is there really anything that is a rite of passage? There's no going out and hunting the lion. There's no, uh, you know, getting a job early type of thing. For us in India, if you get into like med school or or into <laughs> engineering college, then yeah. you've made your rite of passage. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. how it is here in India. So it's a lot yeah. different, you know. But when did the thought come in for about, you know, going into Bosnia? Like who influenced that? Yeah, so I had always had a war just from a very young age. I mean, if you were to talk to my parents or my grandparents or the neighbors for that matter, I, as a child, was always, all my toys were army men. Uh, If there was an old John Wayne, you know, Sands of Iwo Jima movie on, you know, where he's storming the beaches with his men, I was watching that. Something about war I connected with very early on as a child as being 
something exciting and powerful and meaningful. And that, that was always there as well. So, I mean, here you have these three elements, right? You have, you have a, a, you know, a child that, that comes from a very chaotic background who continues a chaotic life by taking a career that is, is everything that chaos is. Um, and then you have this rite of passage component, and then you have this just fascination as a child of war in and of itself. And so all of these things had always been with me and tried to uh, scratch the war itch that was there in 1991 when the U.S. was building up Desert Shield when the first Iraq war came about. I I enlisted in the Army. I joined the Infantry Airborne. I went to basic training. And so, you know, I thought, and I didn't want to kill anybody, right? It wasn't so much that I had this desire to kill as I had this desire to experience. I had this desire to to want to be in those environments and to see how I reacted to them. That was the itch. Uh, I never had a desire to want to harm anybody. But, you know, I, I, I joined for four and a half years. I enlisted for four and a half years in the Army. Um, I'm in basic training for some three weeks. And they call us down one evening uh, out of the barracks, and we all are lined up. And they announce that the war has started, you know, that the invasion of Iraq has started. You know, the news has been telling us about how Iraq is the third or fourth largest army in the world. And, you know, we've been just hearing all of this news for months. And then, you know, I don't know, 24 hours, they call us back down and announce that, you know, the war's over. <laughs> And I'm, I'm looking at a four and a half year enlistment, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, well, I didn't join to like go guard and, you know, an oil pump in Kuwait. Like I wanted to go be in war and now it's over, right? Like I was screwed. So I found a way to get out of that. But that, you know, that left the itch still needing to be scratched. So again, going back to 1992, why did you choose photography? I mean, you weren't a photographer back then, mm-hmm. but why did you choose photography as a ticket into a war zone? Why not anything else? Yeah, so you know, w- the idea. I was sitting in 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 my college courses, and it was this, just before the summer of ninety two. I was I was taking college courses at a at a local. Uh, junior college. And I was waiting outside a professor's office to go speak to her about, you know, the the final papers and the final tests and stuff. And I read this little blurb in, in a Time magazine about this, you know, this, this war building up in the Balkans. And so it just struck me because... You know, it, it, it was talking about the you know the siege of Sarajevo and everything. You know, Sarajevo being sort of the the center point of this conflict that was building. And you know, I thought about Sarajevo and I thought, gosh, you know, we had the Winter Olympics there, and you know, uh, you know, that was a big deal. And you know, now there's a war breaking out there that's just fascinating to me. And I just decided, like, I have got to go figure this piece of me out, this unknown out. I can't go my whole life not knowing about this. I have to go. And I just decided I'm going to go. And I had no idea how to do that, right? There was no internet in 1992. I mean, exactly. Nobody I knew had the internet, right? So there wasn't like I could go do a bunch of background or, you know, it was like, what what came out in the paper that day? And so I just decided I was going to go. And so I had a motorcycle that I had purchased and I sold that and it got me a thousand dollars and I used that and a couple extra bucks. And I was like, I'm going to go. I bought a plane ticket. I bought a train ticket. I, you know, I just looked at a map and said, okay, I want to go here. And I guess I got to go there to get to there and that'll get me to there. And I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'll just figure it out. And a few days before I was about to leave, as in my mind, I'm sort of envisioning this all playing out. I think to myself, you know, someone's going to ask me why I'm there and how am I going to explain this, right? How am I going to sit there and tell them all of this, right? We're going to need, we're going to need beers and cigarettes and, you know, this is going to be a long explanation. Like I need, I need to have a reason. And so as I thought, okay, well, who goes to war zones, like soldiers, mercenaries, I don't know who else, right? But then I've been reading all of these dispatches from Sarajevo from journalists. And so I thought, oh, I'll tell people I'm a journalist. 
And then someone loaned me a camera because they said, you know, you're going on a trip to Europe. You should probably take a camera with you. And I said, fine, not because I wanted to take pictures. Who was that? Just, it was it was my stepmother. Yeah, she had a she had a camera. She loved photography, and she you know said, oh, you're going off to Europe, you know, for the summer. Or you should take a camera with you. And I thought, well, I'm not gonna. I don't know how to use a camera. But I'll take it because it looks like something a journalist will have. So to me, it was a prop. I did buy some film for it. But, you know, if I had a camera and no film, someone might figure out that I was bullshitting. So, you know, couldn't have that. Yeah, it all added to the authenticity of you being a journalist. Right. It all just added to the big lie, right? I just wanted to go. So you bought a ticket and then where did you head out to? Uh, I mean, you didn't fly in straight to Sarajevo, so... No, and I did ask, but no. Uh, they, uh, Delta Airlines was not flying a direct route from San Francisco into besieged Sarajevo, unfortunately. That would have been super convenient. convenient. <laughs> yeah, so, you know... <laughs> I, I called the airlines and I said, uh, this is my story. I'm going to cover this war. How do I get there? And the lady on, you know, the lady who picked up the phone for, for Delta Airlines, you know, said, well, the, the next closest country we fly is is in Hungary. You know, we fly to Budapest so we can get you to Budapest. I thought, OK, well, that, that gets me in the neighborhood. And then I, you know, thought about you know, well, how do I get from Budapest into the war? And I thought, I'll take a train. Let me see if I can take a train. You know, kids go to Europe and they get something called a Eurorail pass, right? I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll see if, you know, so I call a travel agency in, in San Francisco where I live and they say, yeah, we, we tra we've got a train that runs from Budapest to Belgrade, which is, you know, the capital of Serbia. And so my big plan was to, you know, fly to Budapest, take a train from Budapest to Belgrade, walk to the edge of Belgrade heading towards the war and hitchhike. In my mind, I thought, you know, there will be military trucks driving from Belgrade to go attack Sarajevo, and I will thumb a ride on some military truck, a tank, I don't know. And that was the plan. Right. That was in I'll get there. I love how you've got it all so figured out in your head. Yes. It, it, I mean, that's kind of the danger of me. Right. I mean, this is I, I see things in my mind that I go, well, that seems simple. Right. And so it gets yeah. me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> yes. So that was the plan. So that's what I did. I mean, I flew to Budapest. I took a train to Belgrade. I, when I got to Belgrade, it turned into an absolute nightmare. You know, uh, I, I had taken traveler's checks because I have no idea that in war zones, they only take cash, usually American dollars. And so I took traveler's checks. I end, I end up in a country that we hit now have laid sanctions and have an embargo against, and they don't want to cash my traveler's checks. So I'm in Belgrade with no money. I have traveler's checks that they won't cash. And I think, you know, what do I do? I'll go to the U.S. Embassy right? The U.S. Embassy, it'll be this grand, magnificent building, and there'll be Marines out front, and they'll wave at me and be so thankful that I've arrived. They haven't spoken to an American in so long, and they'll, you know, they'll give me a shower and a room and feed me hot dogs and Coca-Colas, right? I mean, I, <laughs> this is what I think. So I leave, I leave the bank that won't cash my checks, and I drive, I, you know, I'm fortunate enough that I'm connected with somebody who's willing to drive me for free to the U.S. Embassy, but it ends up being like this, uh, you know, the embassy's closed and they drive me to like a strip mall. I don't know if you, you know, a strip mall, like a, a, a little shop, uh, you know, that looks, you know, that's next to a, a small market that next to an electronic repair shop. And nobody in there is even American. It's just locals who have been hired to process, you know, visas to and from America, right? So now all I have is a train ticket back to oh, Budapest. Wow. There are no Marines to welcome me. There are no hot dogs and hot baths. Uh, there's just, there's nothing. There's, the, you know, when I go in to announce that I, I'm there, they don't really give a shit. And so now I'm stuck in Belgrade with no food. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm hungry, I'm exhausted. And the only thing I have left is a, is a train ticket back to Budapest. And so I, I at that point, think my trip's over, right? I, I think, you know, I, what do I do now? So I catch this train back to Budapest. I step off the train and as luck would have it, this young lady comes up to me and she hands me this flyer 
to her university that uh, during the summer months, they, you know, essentially rent their dorm rooms out as a youth hostel. And so this young student who goes to this university pays for part of her university by working in the summer at the train stations, trying to get young people like me to go to the university and rent out a room. To the dormitory. Right. A dormitory. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, she travels with me to the dorm to make sure that I go there and sign up because I'm sure that's how she gets credit. And in the car, we talk and I tell her my story and she becomes fascinated by it. And her boyfriend and her, who also live at the dormitory, decide they're going to help me. And so what they do is that they call the local TV station in Budapest, who they had just seen a a documentary story from Sarajevo, and they get in touch with the cameraman and the reporter who had just come back from Sarajevo. And they tell me how to do it. They tell me how to get on a United Nations flight. Now, what they had been told on the phone is that there was a very prestigious U.S. journalist that was looking to get into Sarajevo and could these two gentlemen from the TV station help. And so they they, they feel very flattered. They think I'm, you know, Dan Rather or some, you know, some very important, you know, somebody from CNN. So they start just telling me everything. They tell me to go to Croatia and to go to this very specific airport and that there are United Nations flights flying from this airport into Sarajevo and that I can get on one of these flights. But they ask me one very important question. They ask me, do you have body armor? Well, I don't have any body armor. Like, what? you know, Hmm. why would I need body armor? It's only a war. And they said, well, if you don't have body armor, they won't let you on the flight. And I was like, well, now I'm... You know, and they're like, oh, we'll come by the TV station. We'll give you ours. Wow. So the next day I show up at the TV station and they see me and I have, you know, I have long hair. It's 1992. So grunge music, Nirvana, Pearl Jam. I mean, the, it's a whole thing. And, you know, right. it's a whole genre of, of music. It's a look. And I show up and I look like nothing like a journalist. All my hair is all one length. It's shoulder length. You know, I'm, I, I don't look. I'm 21. I look 15. And the expression on their faces is clearly disappointment. But (laughs) they let me have the body armor. So sweet. So I I get the body armor from them. And I get on a train and I go to Croatia. And then I convince the United Nations that I am am indeed a a journalist, which is befuddling that they could have thought that. And then they put me on a flight and fly me into Sarajevo. And suddenly I'm in the middle of a war. (laughs) Okay. That is like plain crazy story so far and we have so much more left so we'll just take a quick break and we'll come back with what happens in Sarajevo you're listening to the old couple podcast old couple podcast a pandemia inc production are you a friendly fireside chat with friends where no topic is beyond a healthy discussion punctuated with a laugh or two check it out tune in every fortnight on your favorite podcast network Okay, and we're back. And with us, we have Mr. Thomas Hurst himself. And let's take it where we left off. Uh, so, Thomas, why would the UN let you on without any credentials? I mean, you, you're a nobody, right? Or do they just not care? If, if you're in the aid, they'll just fly you into where you want? Sure. Uh, great question. You know, I, I had thought about that. I had thought about the fact that uh, if I, you know, if I told people I was a journalist, I probably should have some type of credentials. And so what I did was I created my own credentials when I was a day or two before I left. I took a passport photo, an extra one that I had, and I, uh, you know, essentially made up a a fake newspaper. Again, no internet. No one's, you know, no one's going to be able to find out or not. So, um I created this press credential and, and, you know, I still have it, obviously. I, I've, I've kept a lot of the, the things from all of my trips. But, and a friend of mine's father created a, a letter of introduction. And so he was, a, he was an attorney and is a, a very dear friend and, a, and always been a mentor of mine. He created a, this very formal looking letter that stated that I was a, a journalist representing uh, a publication out in San Francisco, California, 
and that I should be given all rights and access uh, as any journalist should. And so I used this document and my fake press badge to convince the United Nations that I, I was indeed a journalist. And hence, because of that, they, they put me on the flight. Now, I, what I didn't know was that there was another piece of credential that I was supposed to have obtained before I got on the flight. However, it was so early on in the conflict that, you know, a lot of rules and regulations, you know, hadn't been set in motion yet. When I when I traveled back to Bosnia a year later in 1993, there were a lot of very strict guidelines that had been put in place that created some some challenges for me, but I was able to get through those as well. So, you know, to answer your question, I, I had just enough to to convince them that I was a journalist and and through that they were willing to to you know let me get on the plane amazing amazing yeah so you got on this plane with your body armor and you land in Sarajevo and what happens next i mean well uh, yeah uh you know this giant military airplane you know dives onto the onto the airport there's fighting going on all around the airport at this time and you know, the tail of the aircraft drops and myself and a producer from CNN who was also on the flight, who absolutely wanted nothing to do with me. He, you know, if there was anybody who knew there was a ruse going on, it was this guy. Uh, he, you know, <laughs> he was a real journalist and I looked nothing like him and he was absolutely ignoring me. At every, at every turn. He probably had the tell on you. <laughs> he knew. He knew something was up. If anything, I, I looked like I was going to go join the Bosnian defenders rather than, uh, you know, do anything <laughs> else. <laughs> so, but he kept his mouth shut, but he stayed far away from me. So when the, uh, when the tail on the plane drops, he, you know, he heads down and there's this French foreign legion soldier there who looks like a giant and he looks over this the cnn reporter's credentials and waves him off the tarmac and waves him towards the the set of buildings and then he looks at me and i hand him my the same documents i had handed the the military guys in zagreb croatia uh, and he looks at me and he's like well where's your approved united nations document and i was like well i don't know and he's like, you can't be here. Like, you don't have, you haven't been approved. <laughs> and I, and I just started like, you know, fast talking, you know, just trying to like confuse him, you know, throw different, like made up words and stuff at him. And just, you know, I'm like French foreign legion. How smart could this guy be? Right. I, I can get by this guy. So he, he gets tired of my bullshit and there's bullets flying everywhere. And he snatches me by the back of my neck and drags me into the building to see his commander. And his commander's busy, you know, trying to be a commander and he looks at my shit and he says i don't know what the hell you're doing here but if you if you don't have a ride into sarajevo by sunset i'm kicking you out of here you're getting on a plane and getting out of here like you can't stay here so and he's like you know i'm like well can i you know can i get a ride with you guys <laughs> and he's like and no you can't get a ride with us <laughs> so so now i'm panicked right are there no because taxis over there no there's clearly no taxis running or buses at this moment so I'm panicked because I don't, you know, I know that the airport is somewhere outside of the actual city and it's not like I'm going to just, you know, thumb, thumb a ride from here. I mean, there's, there's clearly a war happening. I'm, it, you can hear it. It's all around us. And I think, you know, the CNN guy must have a driver. There's no way this guy doesn't have a driver. So I run to the front of the airport and the CNN guy is, is trying to get his luggage into a, a small Yugo. And the driver of the Yugo sees me and just being very friendly says, do you need a lift? And I say, yes, I do. And the CNN guy sees me and just can't believe that his driver has invited me to get in the car. And he doesn't say anything. He lets me get in the car. But as I'm trying, as we're trying to stuff all of our gear into this two door Yugo, there's all this shooting happening and there's an explosion that happens right near us. And I don't know, I don't know how close it was. I mean, it was, I mean, all of a sudden there was an explosion and I'm on the ground and I'm laying down on the ground and I'm digging my, my fingers into the concrete and I'm trying to climb under this Yugo. Like within a split second, this happens. 
and everybody's on the ground. The driver's on the ground, the CNN producer's on the ground. It almost feels like it's a, a almost like an out of body experience, not where I'm hovering over my body type of thing, but like there's suddenly like everything goes quiet. I can't hear anything. And there's two distinct voices in my head. And one is saying to me, you know, Thomas, that you've made it. You, 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 you're in Sarajevo. You, there's a war happening. You can get back on the plane right now and you can make up whatever stories you want to make up. You actually did go to a war. You know, no one will know the difference. They'll know, nobody will know how long you were there. You can, you can tell whatever story you want. And this other voice says to me, no, you have to, you have to, you have to get in the car. You have to go. You have to continue with this journey. Dig deeper. Yes, you have to dig deep. If you don't, you will always know that you didn't really do it if you go back into that airport and leave now. And so everybody picks themselves up. No one's wounded. And we all throw ourselves into the car and we speed out of there. And, you know, eventually I wind up at the at the Holiday Inn in downtown Sarajevo. You know, I didn't know about the Holiday Inn. I just it just turned out that that's where journalists who were starting to come to cover the war were staying. Half the building is blown to shit. You know, the other half is I'm pretty sure the mob is running the Holiday Inn. Right. Because they have liquor and they have food and they have water and they have electricity and they have fuel. I mean, you know, somebody's making all of this work. Yeah. Somebody who has power is running. Yeah. It's not like, you know, the the Motel 6 down the road and some manager with no high school education is at the front desk. Like somebody is Correct. making this hotel happen. And so they're renting out rooms on the other side of the building that isn't facing sort of the Serb side part of the city, where there's snipers and shelling and all of that. So they're renting out rooms there. And so I'm suddenly, I'm in the Holiday Inn, and I'm just sitting in the lobby trying to understand how I even got there. Did it feel like a real holiday? Um, it did. I mean, it did feel like a real holiday in. I mean, there were people in their uniforms with their name tags and, you know, very attractive women who, who were serving drinks and people coming and going. I mean, there were no screaming kids in the lobby talking about how they want to go to the swimming pool, but it, it very much felt like, you know, a hotel at the same time, you know, the front uh, area of the lobby was was shattered. There were bullet holes through the glass. I mean, you could see, you know, blown up cars out front. Um, you could hear bullets going, you know, off outside. I mean, you know, so it was very, I, I sat in the lobby and just tried to ground myself. You know, everything had just sort of fallen into place. You know, I, I went, you know, all of these days, you know, experiencing all these terrible roadblocks that made it seem like I would never get there. And now suddenly I'm there and I don't know what to do with myself. Right. I mean, okay, I, I'm here. Now what? I hadn't thought about that. I didn't have a plan for that. Right. I, you know, I, I had a plan to get yeah, there. It's not like you had a mission. Yeah. And now I'm here and now I don't know what to do. So I, I'm thinking, okay, I'm here. I'm going to have to prove to my buddies back home that I actually made it here. They didn't ever believe this, right? So I need some shit. I need I need to collect some 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 stuff. So I I go up into the Holiday Inn, so, several floors up, and I go to the blown out side of the building, and I just start looking for bullets and shell casings and shrapnel and anything that will prove as evidence that I made it here. So I'm rummaging around these blown up rooms and I find, you know, I find like a, a coaster from, you know, Holiday Inn in Sarajevo. I, I find this old phone book in, in one of the one of the rooms. Right. And it's just a fucking phone book. Wow. That says <laughs> Sarajevo, 1984-85. Right. And it's heavy as hell. Right. Like, you know, so I lug this thing around and. You know, and, and so I'm digging, I'm, I've got my pocket knife out and I'm digging bullets out of the wood uh, in the walls. And, and finally, it kind of dawns on me that, you know, if there's bullets in the wood, they must have come from somewhere. So I turn around and I look out and there's all these office buildings and I'm like, oh, maybe there are people shooting into the rooms. I should probably get on the ground. Right. And so now I'm I'm on my hands and knees going room from room looking for shit from Sarajevo so that my buddies back home will believe my story. And I bump into a real war photographer who's in one of these rooms with a translator, a young lady who's a translator for him. And they're looking out over the section of the city because they're trying to figure out if they can get to it for some pictures he wants to take. 
and I bump into him and I scare the shit out of him and the translator because I'm coming in the room like this on my hands and knees. They're looking out the window. So I'm coming in behind them and I bump into him I'm, oh. because I, I'm looking on the ground to make sure I don't cut my hands off with all the broken glass. And I bump into them. Right. And he's like, who the fuck are you? And at this point, I'm so scared. Right. That I'm in this war zone. And and this guy's a real journalist. I mean, this guy is like the guy from CNN didn't look like a journalist. He looked like a guy who works on Wall Street, who somehow got banished to Sarajevo. Right. This guy's a like a war journalist. Right. I mean, he's got the cameras and the and the press badges and the photo vests and the and the boots. I mean, this guy looks seasoned. He's the Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, this guy just looks like he knows what's going on. And I just tell him, I'm like, I, I'm a college kid. I don't even know what the fuck I'm doing here. Like, I, I he's like, oh, so you are honest with him. Oh, I just told him straight from this. I just knew that this guy wasn't going to believe my bullshit. And I was so now so scared and out of my element that it was just like, you know, here's the truth. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Three days ago, I was in San Francisco and all of a sudden I'm in Sarajevo and I'm not even sure how I pulled it off. I mean, I'm, I'm just laughing at the story right now because it's hilarious. But, you know, I can just imagine how scared you must have been at that period of time. Yeah. I mean, when I was a kid and I left to college and I went to a different country, you know, to, to study. And I reached there for the first time. The first week over there was I was so homesick and I was like, what the hell am I doing over here? You put yourself in a war zone, you know, literally looking out at picking up bullets and I can just imagine how scared you were. You know? Absolutely scared with no idea what to do. When I had arrived at the Holiday Inn, I of course asked them how much for a room. And it turned out it was, you know, 80, a hundred dollars. I, you know, I had thought it was more, but it was 80 or a hundred dollars, but I only had $500. I made this whole trip happen, including buying of, a, you know, a backpack and some hiking boots and, you know, all of these things on about $1,200. So I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I wasn't going to be able to stay at the Holiday Inn. The, the cost for the room did not include your meals. So I, so I'm standing in the hallway talking to this, this real war photographer. And, you know, I tell him the whole story in a short amount of time. I'd say I'm, you know, a college kid. I wanted to come see what a war was like. And so I faked my, I faked that I was a journalist and I got here. And he is just beside himself just can't even believe what he's looking at <laughs> so uh you know and he tells me he's like you're you're fucking crazy but he there's something he sees in me that i think in his early days i would he would become a very close friend of mine uh and his name was john downing he was head of uh photography for the daily express in london he had been, you know, a man who had, much like me when he was young, wanted to do this and just figured it out and uh, had really kind of risen up through the ranks to become a very prestigious photojournalist and so and covered many wars. And so in the Holiday Inn, in the hallway outside of these blown rooms, you know, he tells me, he, he says, you know, you're an idiot. Uh, for doing this, but you know, I know I know real journalists who have not been able to figure out how to get into Sarajevo yet. So the fact that you did is quite something. Uh, I'll make you a deal, and he says the deal is this: you do what I say, and you don't do anything stupid to get us killed, and I'll let you come with me. I'll let you ride with me where I go. Wow! I'll I'll take you kind of under my wing, okay? But you can't get us killed. And I wow. was like, absolutely, I'll do whatever you say. You know, I mean, I just jumped at this, right? I mean, and I would come to find out that, one, this is something this man did. He, There were many people like me, young, young people who maybe desired to become photojournalists that he mentored, that he became a friend of, that he helped. And I, to my understanding... There had one time been one of these people that he had met in some other area and who that person ended up being killed. And I think there was something in him that made him feel like I need to maybe help this young man. So he let me, you know, essentially wherever he went, I went. And when he took pictures, you know, I didn't know I'd never taken a picture before. I didn't know how to use a camera. I, I knew how to wow. put the film in it and I knew you pressed a button and then you, you know, turned the arm and it advanced the film. 
but I didn't know how to adjust the shutter speed or the f-stop and how they needed to correlate and depth of field and lighting and, you know, all of the technical aspects. I just knew you pointed your camera at something and you took a picture and hopefully that picture came out. And most of my pictures from that trip did not. But being able to be with this man, uh, I realized that people got paid to do this. I had no idea that people got paid to go to war zones and to document them. And you could make a career of this. But once I saw that you could, and once I experienced what this man was doing, that was it. I knew from that moment that that was what I was going to do with the rest of my life. That's amazing, Thomas. It's crazy how a seasoned journalist like him took you under his wing and protected you kind of like a guardian angel of sorts really? within a war zone. And I presume that's when you took your first photograph. It is. So to hear more, we'll just be right back after this break. You're listening to the Odd Couple Podcast. Odd Couple Pod- Podcast. A Pandemia Inc. production. Are you ready? A friendly fireside chat with friends where no topic is beyond a healthy discussion punctuated with a laugh or two. Check it out! Tune in every fortnight on your favorite podcast network. And welcome back to the Odd Couple podcast. Today we have with us Thomas Hurst, a photojournalist, and we've been talking about how he got into Sarajevo, middle of the Bosnian War, and how eminent photojournalist took him under his wing and mentored him. So, Thomas, tell us more. I mean, what happened next? I mean, he took you under his wing and... Sure. Yeah, I want to know what what's the kind of uh, photographs he took or, you know, did he take you into a live sniper zone or, you know, did he take you into live action? Yeah, well, the, the first thing that, that John helped me do is figure out where I was going to sleep because I couldn't afford to stay at the Holiday Inn and uh, and pay for a room. And then... I I had given some thought of trying to find one of these blown out rooms and and sleep there. But it turned out that other journalists, um, I think uh, John Burns of the New York Times had maybe already tried that. And so there was somebody in the hotel staff who would walk through the blown out rooms to make sure no one was squatting there or camping in there. Right. Yeah. So so John helped me connect with. Uh, I believe it was the the team at BBC, the British Broadcasting Channel, and they uh, agreed to let me sleep in their armored car in the garage underneath the Holiday Inn. So uh, I could stay at the Holiday Inn and be, you know, and be safe, but not have a room. And so I would just me and the and the you know the the garage night guard <laughs> would would hang out, and then I would climb in the back of this, you know armored car that said BBC on the side and I would I would go to bed. The first night John let me crash in his room, let me sleep in his room, but then you know we weren't going to be able to keep that going because the hotel frowned upon it. Uh so then he helped me work out the the BBC opportunity. So one of the things that real journalists need to do within a conflict zone is is they need to f- focus on kind of what is the preeminent part of the story at that moment, right? Yeah, I mean is there a specific story within the the war, the conflict, the the situation that that maybe is representing something greater, something bigger? What is that? What is that story? How do we find it? Journalists don't go to war zones and just wander around doing nothing. Uh, they want to find very specific situations uh, and stories to tell. So the story uh, of, of that few days was about an orphanage in Sarajevo that had needed to get children out of the besieged city. And so uh, the Bosnians and the, and, the, and the Serbs had agreed to a ceasefire just long enough to allow a, a bus filled with orphans to travel out of Sarajevo. And so, you know, it could go somewhere. I don't know if that was... Serbia or to Croatia so that it could get these children out. So the bus is loaded up and the bus starts to leave Sarajevo and a sniper opens up and fires on the bus and kills two children. And then, as I understand it, the bus turns around, the children don't get out. And so John is, hears about this. He hears that the bus has been fired upon and these children are killed and he wants to find these children. 
the reporter that John is working with, uh, a, a very good friend of his from the Daily Express, he's going to write the story about the bus being, you know, shot and killed and, and these orphans being killed. And John wants to find the actual orphans to, to photograph them. So the next day, John, you know, and his translator, we all get in the car and we start driving around the city trying to figure out where these children are. They haven't been buried yet. They're orphans, so they don't have family. People, Somebody's going to have to figure out how to, you know, organize all that. And we end up finding out that these children are in the basement of what used to be sort of like a little medical clinic, a little neighborhood medical clinic, not a hospital, just a place that maybe people would come in the neighborhood who, you know, had a, a sickness or, a, you know, an emergency or something but in, you know, not a hospital. So we find this location and we talk with these doctors that are there, these doctors and nurses that are there and explain what we're doing. And they, you know, show us in this sort of basement area where these children are. And so, you know, we walk through there, there's bodies everywhere. Again, this is the the beginning of, of the siege, you know, of Sarajevo. And so there, there's bodies all over the floor, some of them covered, some of them not, some of them are, you know, military or, you know, people defending the city. Most of them are, you know, old women and civilians and, you know, bombs have just gone off and killed them. And they're just there waiting for, I guess, family to pick them up and to, to bury them. And so we're shown to a, a, a room and there are these two children and they're, you know, in their clothes uh, and they, they're they laying on a on a, a essentially a, a silver table. And there's this one light that's shining in the room. It's, um, it's a small window and it's higher up in the room because it's, it's in a sort of basement type setting. And so for, for there to be a window in this room, it's very close to the ceiling and the sun is shining down and it's casting this light right onto their bodies. And John starts taking pictures. Well, John, I've never taken pictures before. So because John is taking pictures, I've got my camera, I take pictures. So the very first picture I ever take is of these two dead babies. And I, and I, and I'm taking these pictures and in that moment is when I, I know that this will be my life's work. And I believe in that moment that, you know, like me, no one has ever seen anything like this. And when they see these pictures back home, people will become so shocked and so furious that they will demand that our government, you know, stop this war. And this is what I believe. I I believe that, you know, if I go to places like this and make these type of very compelling images, that people will become informed and educated and through that want to make a difference. And so it it just suddenly all of this comes together for me in this basement standing over the these two dead children. And and that's the first thing that John and I do together. Wow. Really engrossing. <laughs> but how did you deal with that, John? I mean, it's like, I mean, like, I remember I'm a med student, right? I mean, I'm a doctor. So I remember going to the mob for the first time. And um, it's okay to see the the adults. I mean, you know, when they we do our dissection and everything. But I was once at one of the uh, morgues where they were doing an autopsy for children. It was one of the most difficult things that I you know, I had to go through in life. And I, and I swore that there's no way I'm going to go and do this kind of stuff. So having to stand there and take a shot of these kids must have been really, really difficult. I mean, the war is one thing, but, you know, when children lose their life, right, mm-hmm. it's really sad. Yeah. There's something that happens. And I don't, you know, honestly, I don't know. You know, I can't say that it happens for everybody. I know that for me, you know, I'm a very visual person. Everything that I that I go and do, I do because I've already seen it in my mind. And it takes away some of that fear and some of that doubt and insecurity. Um, When I was in that room with those children, I envisioned a light switch in my mind. And I envisioned myself flipping that light switch off. And when I did that, everything around me became quiet. It was as if I got tunnel vision. And then to raise the camera up in front of my face and to view the world and these children through that camera, it felt like it was a a shield. It was a shield to reality. 
and what I what becomes important now is not my feelings, but how do I how do I make an image that is going to move people? And what I did not realize then, and I did not realize throughout the entirety of my career, was that while I could shut down aspects of my mind so that I could do what I was there to do, it did not uh, save me from what I had seen or, or heard or, or smelled or felt. And those things over time would come back to me, that they were things that um, I still took away and they would eventually build to the point that they would pour out of me. But throughout my the entirety of my career, and I was in some some very intense environments and saw some incredibly brutal things throughout almost 20 years of doing this around the world. And that light switch was sort of my mental unplugging. And it was, you know, I would be in environments where there was, you know, bombs going off and people screaming and, you know, people's guts coming out of them. And and I all of a sudden I couldn't hear any of it. You, you sometimes hear about athletes who, who go to play in a big game and a reporter, well, you know, what was it like to hear a hundred thousand screaming voices? And they say, I couldn't hear any of it. You know, I, something else takes over and I just knew to just do what I was there to do, but I couldn't hear any of what everybody else could. And that's very much what would happen to me throughout my career. And it started that day. But yes, you know, I also didn't have children. And so now I'm a father. I've had five children. I've lost a child. I don't know that I emotionally could go do that work again. Right. So, Thomas, you were mentioning how there's a light switch and the camera is a shield against reality. And that's what you did for over 20 years. But how about, I mean, war is one kind of scenario which you have been in, like how you were in Sarajevo in Bosnia. But I also read that you were in Rwanda covering the genocide or just after that, uh, which is a very different, it's not war, war, it is, it's a very different animal altogether. Mm -hmm. And you are a photojournalist over there. Again, over here in, in Sarajevo, you couldn't stop what happened. You were documenting an aftermath of it. But have you been in a position where you were documenting something that's happening live and you couldn't do anything about it and felt helpless? Yeah. Um... You know, when I was coming up through after 92, and then I go back to Sarajevo in 93, in 93, and I'm going to answer your question here. In 93, I, I have a, a an incident where I'm back in Sarajevo. I've had a year away. I went back to, to school. I started studying photography. I started trying to learn about journalism. And I, I, I'm now trying to learn the craft. And so... Uh, at the same time, there's still very much this side of me that just wants people to think something that I'm special. I want to be able to tell people that I'm a war photographer because I want them to think that I'm different, unique, special, courageous, all of these things, all of these very, all these things rooted in insecurity. So I go back in 93 to Sarajevo and I have a run in where some Bosnian soldiers who, uh, they, they drag me down an alleyway. And they want my body armor. And there's no one around. There's all this fighting that's kind of happening. And it's, you know, it's a bit of a story. But uh, they drag me down an alleyway. They want my body armor. And there's, there's three, four of them. You know, nobody else is around. And I think I can talk my way out of it, right? I think I'm cute and funny. And so I know what they're saying to me. They don't speak English. I don't speak Serbo-Croatian. But I know the word for body armor, right? And they're, they're telling me that they want my body armor. And I'm like, oh, you know, here, have a cigarette. I, you know, ha have some candy, have some bubble gum, you know, geez, you guys, you know. And finally, one of them puts their uh, AK to my head. Oh, my God. And I think... Things get real, real fast. Yeah. Now, no? I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? And I take my body armor off and I put it on the guy and I'm like, oh, that looks so amazing on you. Wow. It was like it, it, was, like <laughs> it was made for you. You know, I'm like, have it here, yours. And then the, the, the four or so of them begin to talk amongst themselves. And I'm thinking to myself, they're trying to decide whether they want to kill me or not. I mean, all they would need to do is put a bullet in me and walk away. I mean, you know, young journalist, you know, shot by sniper in Sarajevo, news at 11. 
right? No one's going to know who fucking did this. The four of them will, but nobody else will. And I think to myself, oh my God, like I'm, this is not a joke. Like this is fucking real. I have to get serious about this. And they let me go. They, you know, drag me back out of the alleyway. They literally kick me in my butt and send me along my, on, on my way. And I decide then in that moment that like, this isn't a game. This isn't where I get to dress up and come over here and play war photographer. Like if I'm going to do this, I actually need to know what the hell I'm doing or I'm going to end up dead. And so I come back from the summer of 93 and I tell myself I'm not going to another war until I actually know how to do this. And so from 93 to January of 96, all I do is study photography, documentary photography, journalism. I read every book. And again, there's no internet, right? So there's, there's you know, I'm having to go to bookstores and call up newspapers and talk to photographers who some are friendly and some tell me to screw off and, you know, and just figure this out. So from 93 to 96, all I do is, is try to learn and educate myself on, on this craft. It's, you know, it's, it, there's lots of books on photography of butterflies and children and birthdays, and there's not a whole lot on war, right? They, there's not a whole lot on that. So in 96, and this is to get to your point, I, I go to Haiti and I go to Haiti because it's, you know, I, I'm on, I'm on uh, winter break from school. It's the closest kind of event that's happening that the U.S. is interested about. And it, what's happening in Haiti is it's the first democratic uh, elected change of power in Haiti's history. Uh, jean Patron Aristide had been removed through a coup. The U.S. invaded Haiti, reinstalled him as as the president, uh, the rightful president of of Haiti. And I think that was in '94. And in '96, they have free elections, and they have you know a new president that is elected. So I decide that I'm going to go cover that. And so again, I'm not, I'm, I'm a college kid. So I, I, I'm not a real, you know, I'm, I'm studying journalism, but I'm not a professional. No one's paying me. And so I go to Haiti with all the fake credentialed stuff again. I don't, you know, I figure it out. I fly to Haiti. I catch a cab into Port-au-Prince, into the city. I find a hotel to, to stay in. And I start, you know, just walking around. That's, you know, the city and, and, and taking pictures. But one of the things I did was I, I found the local Associated Press photographer there. And what I realized was that if I told people, hey, I'm just a college kid trying to learn, would you teach me? People felt very honored by that. And they would let you come around. They would let you, you know, sit in the office. They would let you get in the car with them and go with them when they took pictures. And they felt good about teaching someone. And I needed to learn. So it was a great relationship. And so I'm taking these, I'm taking pictures one day of some U.S. troops leaving Haiti, right? Everything's safe in Haiti now. Let's get our troops out. And I'm take, I take this picture and I'm like, this is the same type of shit I see in Time Magazine all the time. So I decide, I, you know, I'm going to call Time Magazine. So I call Time Magazine up. I, you know, um, I'm in Haiti, so I've got to do a little digging on, using the, the phone. And I got to figure out a phone number for Time Magazine. And I call the front desk and I tell them, you know, I'm a photojournalist and, you know, you know, covered the war in Bosnia in 92 and 93. And, you know, I need to talk to the photo department. And someone from the photo department gets on the phone and I say, yeah, you know, Thomas James Hurst, I'm down here in Haiti coming the, covering the, you know, democratic exchange of power. And I, you know, I took some pictures of, you know, some troops leaving and I thought maybe you guys might be interested And they're like, who, like, who, who are you? And I, yeah, Thomas, Thomas Hurst, you know, like, you don't know me, you know, Thomas Hurst, uh, you know, war photographer, you know, in Bosnia, 92, 93. And they're like, yeah, we, we've never heard of you. And I'm like, well, you know, anyway, you know, I've got these images and they're like, yeah, we're not interested, but why don't you leave us your phone number? So I leave them the phone number of where I'm staying and sure as shit, they call me back two days later and they hire me. Crazy. Hey, we've got some we've got some writers that are actually heading down to Haiti to cover the story. We want you to shoot pictures for them and we'll pay you 500 bucks a day and all your expenses. And I was like, holy shit. Hell yeah. And so I hang up the phone and then I go, holy Things shit. Things just got real. Now what? Right? Like, I don't know what to do. 
so the reporters, they fly down. They send two reporters down from New York. They fly down. I think one was from Miami and one was from New York. They want to meet for dinner. Again, I've never done anything professional in my life, right? So, you know, I get my clothes on and get my big boy voice on and I, you know, meet them for dinner. And so I'm hoping they're going to tell me what they want me to take pictures of because I don't know. And so we're sitting there, we're having conversations about their story, and I'm trying to get some ideas. And so all of a sudden, the power goes out, which is not uncommon in Port-au-Prince. The power goes out, and it's pitch black, and the reporter says, now this, this is what I want a picture of. And I'm like, it's pitch fucking black. Like, how am I going to take a picture? <laughs> That's what you want? Like, I'm screwed. Time Magazine is never going to hire me again. I'm, I'm... I'm dead in the water here. So long story short, to, to, to answer your question, I end up covering a funeral. There, there's a slum in Port-au-Prince called Cité Soleil. And it, it started out as sort of a, you know, an area of the city that people just, you know, put tarps up over. And then it builds up into be this enormous slum. It's a neighborhood just of, of, large of a large size in Port-au-Prince and there's a community leader who lives in this community and who who is constantly trying to make the lives of these people better and there's a gang in this city as in every place there's a group of people who are doing bad things and taking advantage of the weak and somebody from this gang members of this gang find this community leader who's causing problems for them and they kill him well, the people of the slum become outraged and they they go on a hunt one morning, you know, the day after this this man's death, they go hunt down all of these people associated with this gang and they just literally take machetes to them. It's it's Rwanda esque shit. They just start hacking people in the middle of the street. And the day after that, these these new these reporters from Time magazine show up, I'm walking through the city looking for something to take a picture of for their story. And all of a sudden, there's these black smoke and these burning tires. And I'm just, you know, something obvious is happening. And I am just so scared to go towards this. And I'm having this conversation in my head. And the conversation in my head is much like the conversation that I had in the, when the, when the bomb went off outside of the airport, uh, you know, which, you know, it was Thomas, you have to get in the car. The conversation in my head now is you have to go down there. You take pictures. You have, you, you can't tell somebody that you saw this, like you have to go take these pictures. And so I would walk 20 yards towards it and I would stop and I would tell myself, no, you have, and I'm so scared. I don't know. I mean, cars are trying to drive down this road that has been blocked off with these tires and the cars are being attacked. And I can see this happening, but it's too, still too far away to take a good picture of. And so then I would walk 20 more yards and I would stop. I go, no, I have to get closer. I have to do, this is it. This is what I want to do. If this is what I'm going to do, I have to go down there. And I get a little bit closer and I stop. And suddenly from behind me, I hear in, in very good English, would you like to go down there? And I turn around and I'm staring at someone's chest. Now I'm five foot nine. Okay. And I'm looking at someone's chest and I look up and there is the largest Haitian man I have ever seen. Like this guy must be six, three, six, four, six, five. Now Haitians, they're, they're African and French, right? They're, they're this blend. They're not big people, right? They're, they're more like very, thin and must, you know, defined build. And here is this enormous man and he's wearing this, this, this like nice hat, uh, like a fedora or something. It's this very large man. And I go, yeah, I really want to go down there. And he goes, I will take you. And so he takes me down there to where these burning tires are. And, and there's this body that's laying in the street. That's been, you know, some, this man has been killed and there's like a cinder block next to him that he's had his head bashed in with. And I start taking pictures and this man is with me and he's, he's guarding me. He's protecting me. Another guardian angel. Right. And so we're on this main street right out of outside of this slum. And there's all this commotion and chaos happening in the slum. And he's like, do you want to go in there? And I go, yeah. And he goes, come on. And he takes me in there and there's just fucking bodies everywhere. And I'm talking bodies that like, 
their heads are split wide open from machetes. And now people are taking tires and they're, they're putting them on top of the bodies and they're getting gas and they're lighting these bodies on fire. And people are all standing around this, this, this moment happening. And then suddenly right next to me, this guy collapses because someone from behind him has hit him with a machete and he is hacking him to death. What? Oh God. Yeah. I mean, it's just chaos. And I move out of the way and I start taking pictures of that. And then I, you know, and then, and then it happens over here and I go and I go down there and it's happening everywhere. And so I'm just going from, you know, murder to murder to murder. So somebody hacked the, the big Haitian man, not the big guy, another, uh, just another human oh, being, okay. just somebody else standing there. Not, not my guy. Okay. Okay. Not my guy. Oh, right. Thank God. That would have been a little hard to take in, right? How do you sleep at night? <laughs> no, not my, my guardian angel does not die in this story, right? It's just another person in the crowd that happened to be watching this other thing happen that somebody saw and decided that's a bad guy too and just decided to kill him. So this is happening all over this, this, this area. Well, I end up, I look over and there is this very tiny, maybe five foot one, five foot two blonde woman. And she's got all of her cameras. And you can tell a professional photographer when you see one. They always have two cameras for the most part. You know, when they're covering a news story, if you see a photographer that's out just sort of wandering, taking pictures of something, it could be a professional, could not. But when you're covering news, you know a real news professional photographer. They look like it. And so this woman and I, we start talking. She has a, she has a, a, a fairly large, you know, Haitian man that's kind of her driver, her translator, her protector with her. And he's, you know, making sure that she's safe when she's doing what she's doing. And so her and I begin to talk and I tell her I'm working for Time Magazine. She's like, who, you know, like, who are you? And I'm, I'm like, oh, Thomas Hurst. You know, I, I give her the same stick I gave Time Magazine. Yeah, I'm a war photographer. You know, I uh, covered the war in 92 and 93 in Bosnia, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, yeah, I never heard of you. But she's real nice, right? She's a real nice lady. Well, there's safety in numbers. Journalists like to work in these environments together, right? We can look out for each other. We can protect each other. We can help each other, right? And so naturally, her and I just sort of, you know, we start moving from scene to scene to scene, from death to death to death, as it happens in, you know, suddenly in this, this area. And her guy is coming and, you know, with us. And so finally, the guy that's with me, the big guy that's with me says, do you feel safe now? You've met this person, you're, you're working with her and she has somebody, you know, do you feel safe now? And I, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good. And he's like, okay, I'm going to leave. And he starts to leave. And I say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, I said, what's your name? And he looks at me and he says, my name's Moses. And I said, your name's Moses. What are you saying? Really? I'm like, that's not Haitian. There's nothing Haitian about Moses, right? And so I turn to my lady friend who I've become friends with. Her name's Carol Guzzi. She's a photographer for the, for the Washington Post. She's actually won like four or five Pulitzer Prizes. She is incredible. Her and I become very close, best friends. She comes to my wedding. Her and I travel to Rwanda together. We're in Kosovo. We, we, we become a team of, of partners. And, and I turn to her and I'm like, this guy's name is Moses. Like, I'm shocked. And I turn around and I go, his name is Moses. And he's gone. What? He's vanished into the crowd. Like a, a six foot five Haitian man has just vanished. And I'm like, did you see him? And she's like, yeah, where'd he go? And I'm like, I don't know. But it's just this very surreal moment where I needed somebody to help me move into this next phase of my career this whole scenario becomes everything that time magazine wants the pictures that that time magazine ends up publishing that launches my professional career is a moment where this man moses helped me get to and is actually standing in the picture that i make you can't see his face. You just see him from the waist down because I'm taking a picture of a dead body and I'm kneeling down on the ground shooting out. So you just see him from his stomach down. But that's the only thing I have to reflect back on that this man named Moses helped me on this day. And it launches my career. 
Time Magazine publishes my pictures. My, my name is in Time Magazine, but it doesn't say who I'm working with. So now all of a sudden I'm getting calls from photo agencies wanting to know who I am and wanting to work with me. I mean, it, it starts everything for me in my professional career. But the question that got us here was, have you ever been in an incident where something was happening and you felt helpless? All of that is to answer this question. The day of the funeral for this beloved community leader comes. And my new friend, Carol and I, who now her and I have, you know, we get along great. We, you know, we become very good friends. Her and I spend the rest of, you know, my trip in Haiti working together and go on to work together in other places, as I said. Her and I go down to the City Soleil where there's going to be this funeral procession that walks through the Port-au-Prince carrying the casket of this beloved community leader. And they're going to bring him into, you know, the, the main cemetery of the capital city, Port-au-Prince. And, and, and Haitians are very emotional people that, you know, they're, they're, they create incredible works of art. They're very colorful. They're very, you know, very dramatic. They're, they're just a very beautiful, rich people. And it's, it, you know, in terms of just their, their character and their soul. And, and so, you know, there's just gr a lot of great images that come out of this funeral, right? I mean, it's just very colorful. It's tropical. There's a lot of emotion, and so the community leader is buried. It's a very peaceful day. And we're, Carol and I are coming out of the, the cemetery, and there's hundreds of people. I mean, it's, the streets are packed for this whole event. And suddenly there's a commotion. And so and there's a commotion, and there's some yelling and some screaming. And so Carol and I, we, we quickly you know, want to know what's happening, and we move to it. And, and there is this young man who's being pulled at and beaten and punched and kicked and he falls down and he gets back up and he's screaming and he's trying to run away and he runs down this a street to get away and suddenly people block him and the people that are attacking him catch him and they start beating him again uh, and so we start photographing this at some point as he's again pulling away and trying to run away somebody which i can only ex only think was a police officer, but in, in plain clothes. He pulls out a pistol, a revolver, and he puts his arm around this young man and he holds his gun up in the air. And as best as I can tell, what he's saying is, hey, we'll arrest him. We'll take him to the police station, right? He's trying to intervene on this young man's behalf. He commandeers a, a truck, a small truck, that's loaded up with some stuff. He, he, he stops the truck and tells the driver that, as best as I can tell, we're going to take this young man to the station. To the, station. the young man gets in the middle of the truck, in the middle seat, right? It's a very small truck. Uh, and then the police officer, the man with the revolver, gets into the passenger seat. So this young man is now sandwiched in the truck. A bunch of people jump in the back of the truck, including my friend Carol. Well, there's no room in the back of the truck, so I jump, I, I jump on the hood of the truck, and I'm just sitting on the hood of the truck as it's driving. Well, there's so many people that the truck can barely move, and it's moving at just a, like a few miles an hour, right? It's not moving very quickly, but it's trying to move and, and get, to, get to where it's going. Suddenly, a group of men stop the truck completely. And they say something to this policeman. Now, I don't know what they say, but the next thing that happens is the policeman puts his revolver away, opens the truck door, and walks away. Oh, God. And these three men reach into the truck. Now, the driver gets out of the truck, and he walks away. And this young man starts screaming. He knows what's about to happen. Whatever these guys told the police officer was enough to make him realize that he wasn't going to be able to save this guy. And they finally drag this man out of the truck. And as they're yanking him out of the truck, and now I'm right there, I'm sitting on the hood of the truck. As they're pulling him out of the truck, I step off of the truck and the door, you know, is pushed closed. And all of a sudden I see a knife, a large, like kitchen knife, like a large kitchen, knife, the big blade that you would use to cut steak or something. I see it come in and it stabs this man in his stomach. And I, I mean, as close as, I mean, I could put my arm around this guy. I mean, we're almost shoulder to shoulder. I'm that close. 
and suddenly his intestines fall out and the knife blade breaks. And this is all, I am just absolutely shocked by what is happening. And the, and I flipped the light switch and suddenly there, I mean, I was hearing screaming from everywhere and suddenly I can hear nothing. And this man is trying, this young man now is, his guts are hanging out of him and he's trying to get away. And somebody takes a, you know, a giant two by four piece of wood and hits him in the head. And he's trying not to fall to the ground. And another man takes a metal pipe and hits him in the head. And he's just kind of stumbling. And I don't, all I, I don't know what to do. I'm just, I just, all I know to do is to take pictures. And finally, this young man falls to the ground. And they just are over top of him, beating him. And then another man comes in with a giant cinder block and just slams it on his head. And they kill this kid. And all I did was take his picture. I did nothing to help this man. You know, it really makes me wonder sometimes, you know, like, I mean, I'm just wondering, like, do you ever think about humanity and how we can do stuff like this to each other? I mean, you put yourself so many times in such situations where such things are happening and and like whether it was in Rwanda or whether it's this, you know, how do we do this to each other? Why do we do this to each other? Have you ever asked yourself this or you just turn your switch off? And- yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, you know, you want to know what's really interesting is that when I got home from that, that trip, you know, when I come back from Haiti, I'm in, I'm in my hometown of Mill Valley, California. It's just north of San Francisco. It's a very affluent community. And I'm home not just a few days, and here's a news story about a town 20 miles away. And it's a news story on how an elderly man was out walking, and a group of three or four young men beat him to death for no reason. And here I was thinking that this shit only happens in third world countries. This shit only happens in places like Africa, like in Rwanda, or in Eastern Europe or in South America, or in Haiti. And here it is, right here. Happens everywhere. What I learned is that there is real evil. And I have learned that human beings are very complex. And that put under the right amount of fear, pressure, we will do anything to survive. You look at... Rwanda, you look at Bosnia, you look at Kosovo, you look at any of the conflicts, normal people will do extraordinarily evil things to protect what they love. And so much of it starts with radical ideology that the common man begins to listen to. Correct. And begins to believe. And it creates a fear in us that causes us to want to just survive. You know, in Rwanda, you've got, I mean, story after story of we've lived together our whole lives. And then suddenly they came in and killed everybody. You know, in Bosnia, you have, we didn't even know they were Serbs. And they didn't know that we were Muslim. Like, we just were neighbors. And suddenly they burned our house down and killed everybody. These are people like you and I who just get up and work a job every day. And suddenly there's a a scenario that develops and there's people beating that drum over and over and over until there's a movement of people who are willing to believe that their way of life, what they believe, what they want, what they dream is somehow being compromised and taken advantage of. And there is no greater example right now than the four years that we just came out of America with Donald Trump. You look at what happened here uh, in January 6th, the storming of the Capitol building, and you can say, here are just your daily, for the most part, these aren't radical people by nature. These are people who for four plus years have heard over and over and over that something is being taken away from them and they need to take it back. And they do extraordinarily horrible things to do that. And this is humanity. And the truth is, man, we are more alike than we are different. That's the scary part. 
Yeah, I don't know you two at all. And I can I can promise you that you two men want to live a life that is peaceful, where you can raise a family, raise children, have a good job to to accommodate the life that you would care to live so that you can grow old and die. Absolutely. That's it. That's it doesn't matter. The, yeah, it doesn't matter the accent in your voice. It doesn't matter your skin tone. It doesn't matter where you live. We all want the same shit. We all want the basic thing. And yet we were too afraid of someone taking that away from us. And we, we're too quick to, to run to that because of our fear. You know, I just love the way how you, you kind of summed it up, human mentality and, you know, what drives us. And you just gave us the example of what's happening in, um, uh, what happened in the U.S. over the last four years. And it, it just reminds me constantly that all this social media, which is running in, you know, there are a lot of people drumming up a lot of ideas over and over and over again. And the young crowd is just hearing this stuff over and over again until they start believing that there's something there. And um, yeah, I think people should listen to your, to you, to your story, to what you've just told us and really take away something from it. Because at the end of the day, there's nothing good which comes out of war. There really isn't. And if you, you don't have to be a historian to look back over the history of man and go, we just live in a cul-de-sac. We just go round and round and round and round. And, you know, it's hard for me to believe in a philosophy of evolution when we don't actually evolve. I mean, there's so many times me and Sid have talked about this, about, you know, about where we head and and why we do what we do and each one has their perspective and and it's just right what you just said which is you know somebody just keeps drumming that same idea into their head that and this is absolutely normal people and we see the same thing happening in our country today where you know they start uh, you know this whole religious angle of politics where they keep saying the hindus and the muslims the hindus and the muslims and on our level there's absolutely no issue they, you know everything is normal but you know Right. So for me, it was like beautiful the way you just put it in perspective was just so great. Yeah. And it is, it is so strange that the message isn't changing. It's always a message of fear. You know, it's always the message of fear. Like, you know, the message is wrong when it, it is taking you to a place. Fear is irrational. I mean, most often fear is irrational. Like we, we, ha we have been given the sensitivity and the functionality to experience fear for a reason. When there's a truck barreling down the street at you, you should feel afraid. And because of that, you should move, right? Get out of the way. But this imaginary fear that get ready, the bad guys are coming, you know, this is irrational. And it's unfortunate because, I mean, and it's not new. It doesn't, it, you know, the drum is always the same. It's just who's banging the drum is different. Amazing. Thank you so much, Thomas, for taking time out. Thank you, guys. And I think this is like one of the episodes which I wouldn't dare edit <laughs> because <laughs> it's all pure gold. Thank you so much for joining us. I really would like to thank all the listeners to patiently listen through this. Before you know it, so many minutes have passed and it is just a, such an amazing episode. So thank you so much, Thomas, for joining the Odd Couple podcast for this chat. We will definitely have one more episode with you soon. So keep tuned in. Do check out Thomas's blog, as well as all the photographs that you see on our YouTube channel, which we shall feature. So keep tuning in. This is Siddharth here. This is Dr. Sheesh signing out. Until next time. Bye-bye.